And so I love that. Okay. So today, I think um, with our panel of speakers, we have the best of the best here that is going to talk to us about Muskegon. They've experienced the past, they're entrepreneurs for the development of the future, and they know what's going on, um, you know, and how the community is going to change. So thank you so much for coming and being part of this program. And if you have time, I hope you get to explore the exhibit afterwards, because I think it's, it's a good one. And it definitely shows that this community has an appetite for more local history, which we're going to be exploring with our exhibits in the future. So thank you, everybody, and welcome. We have Dave Alexander with the city, Cindy Larson with our chamber, and Frank Peterson, who is was with the city and now who is entrepreneur and developing. So I'll just turn it over. Thank you guys for being here. I'm up first, I guess. Um, welcome. Thanks for coming out. Um, I think this is something that we're passionate about. Um, our community, its past, uh, obviously, its future. Um, I've done numerous tours downtown over the years, uh, last decade. And I start out by saying that we are in a historic transformation. And I would credit the uh, two panelists that I'm with here as being very key um, in terms of leading and sparking that uh, transformation that we are in. Um, for me, it all is about Muskegon Lake. That's why we're here. It's our identity. Um, it's the reason for being. I'm starting with the indigenous peoples. Um, they came here for the resources and the uh, transportation um, uh, aspects of Muskegon River and Muskegon Lake into Lake Michigan. Um, the French fur traders came here for those resources, as did the English and the Irish uh, as lumberjacks uh, during the era that uh, was our glory time in terms of uh, the, uh, the lumbering era here in Muskegon. I think most of us um, who've been around long enough uh, realize what came next. And that was the industrial era. And um, we see vestiges of it today. Um, and that was really the central and Eastern European and Southern uh, Blacks came into Muskegon to create um, the uh, uh, energy and the uh, products that, uh, that we are, are known for, especially before and right after World War II. We are now in what I call the quality of life era. And that's um, a three-legged stool for our, our economy here in Muskegon County. Uh, advanced manufacturing, we still make things here in this country. Um, healthcare and uh, hospitality. And I think those have all blended together uh, here uh, in the last 10 years to create uh, what, again, is a historic transformation. I like to go back. Uh, I came here in 1981 and worked for 34 years for MLive and the Muskegon Chronicle. Um, and I remember uh, my wife and I talking about the first images that we had in Muskegon, um, never coming here prior to uh, getting jobs. And uh, that was of uh, what was called the Wiener property. We now know it as Heritage Landing. And it was before um, Shoreline Drive was in. So Western Avenue was going on down past the, uh, the um, uh, depot uh, where the Convention Visitors Bureau is at. And you literally went over Western Avenue like this because it was settling from all of the tailings from the uh, not industrial era, but from the lumbering era. And you look out, you'd like to take a look at um, Muskegon Lake and you saw the Wiener property, which was what is now Heritage Landing, was a foundry dump. It had big piles of rusting um, steel. I remember uh, exploring it with another colleague of mine, Dave Kolb, at one point, and there was a micro bus uh, BW from the 60s, early 60s back there, up on blocks. And next to it was this little oil pump, like we're going to actually suck the oil back out of the out of the um, soil and uh, the groundwater at that point. Obviously, in the early 80s, it became um, what I would consider one of the uh, finest uh, outdoor venues in the state of Michigan, especially uh, home to a summer celebration today, home to um, the Irish Music Festival and of... Uh, the uh, Unity Christian Music Festival. So uh, really key was uh, downtown then, uh, when I was here, um, was the Muskegon Mall, and that was depicted um, through those uh, urban renewal years of uh, late seven or late 60s, early 70s. Understand with the Muskegon Mall that it was the number one um, shopping destination uh, for Muskegon County and the Lakeshore. I went down to about, um, uh, M45 and went up to probably a little further north than Ludington. It was where people went to shop. Um, that obviously has changed. 
uh, as the Lake Mall went in, but then the Lake Mall is not obviously what it used to be. So the dynamics of our economy and retailing have changed Muskegon tremendously. But since the uh, closing of that mall, 2001, 2002, um, major things that have gone on is we've had Imagine Muskegon, and that was a community. Um, many of you, I look in the audience, is probably involved in that uh, planning process, and the plans that we've got are really being implemented here the last 10 or 15 years in downtown Muskegon. The streets were rebuilt 2004, 2006, and I, I point to two things that came into the downtown early on as being sort of a foundation of, of what we've got in the transformation of our downtown, and that was Unruly and Pigeon Hill. And the uh, microbrew uh, uh, industry has transformed many a downtown of communities like ours across the state and especially across the state and especially the Upper Midwest. Um, finally, um, the arena, the hotel, and the convention center uh, were a final um, uh, added addition to uh, something that we've been hoping for for the decades that I've been in town, and that would be a small convention center. And I found um, in my reporting probably the uh, finest public-private partnership that we uh, have put together in this community in terms of Parkland, the county, the city, and um, the, uh, the community and, and hospitality. Um, so with that, I'll send it off to my um, friends and colleagues. Good, good job, Dave. Okay, so I um, grew up in the White Lake area. So um, to me, uh, Muskegon was the place to go for shopping, even healthcare, uh, entertainment. And so I'm old enough to remember pre-mall uh, because this is where we would come to go school shopping, right? And to the Sears, big Sears downtown. It was the first place I saw a movie at the, what that time was the Michigan Theater. And so I have those same, if you went to a special birthday dinner, you would drive into Muskegon. So I, I do remember that Muskegon that people longed for for so long. Um, and then, but then I left because it was the early 80s and I was with the generation where it was the last one in Michigan, turn out the lights. Remember those slogans? There was a million of them. And so there was a whole generation of us that really left because the, we didn't think there was any opportunity here. Uh, so in that leaving, um, ended up going to Chicago, where I started to learn a little bit about cities and architecture and development, because that was always the big discussion. Who's, what's the next new building? Where's the next new development? And saw those neighborhoods change. And so happened to learn about that. Then I ended up going to the state. Um, and this this came into play much later. I didn't know I was going to be living my life developing downtown Muskegon when I first started this whole thing. Uh, but when I went with the state, um, they put us on an assignment where we had to start to analyze the assets of the various Michigan cities. And we literally walked around and went to all these cities with clipboards and said, well, they've got this, they got this, they got this. And when we came to Muskegon, it was like, wow, we really have it all. There's so many cities in Michigan that don't have what we have uh, in terms of the water is number one, right? We're on that water. We had our own airport. We had an industrial base. We had this, this amazing history. We had these state parks. We just, the list would go on and on and on when it came for the in infrastructure, the transportation system, and the way, way we can just get in and out of town. These are things that are very, very difficult to recreate. So fast forward when, um, when that I came to taking on the job at the chamber and it wasn't long after that, that they locked up the mall. Okay. So they chained up the mall. And so of course I was relatively new to the job and I'm like, Oh my God, I'm in charge of a chamber of commerce where the downtown is locked up. <laughs> and so it's like, it got worse than that. After that. <laughs> it, did. it did get worse than that. So there was no decision about having to um, dedicate time to the downtown. It was it was just what we had to do in order to survive and do our job. So there was no choice about it. But the more we we really took a lot of time studying downtowns at that point, and the consultants were brought in. Uh, I took off and went to every seminar I could go to back then. That was pre-internet. So we had to read old fashioned books, right? <laughs> so we would read books about development and bring the authors in and have them speak to us. So we really understood that the core city, the condition of the core city had the rippling effect on the entire county because the Chamber of Commerce is countywide. It's not about the city, it's a countywide. And at that time, Harvey Street was really taking off. 
And it didn't matter how much people were investing in Harvey Street, millions of dollars, that whole area, none of it existed. Those of you may not even know of that whole area. We got the we had the first Starbucks in Michigan on Harvey Street. So that thing was rocking and rolling. At the same time, you go up to White Lake and how Met was investing still hundreds of millions of dollars and continuing to create jobs. But it didn't matter because our downtown was dead. And it didn't matter what we say said, they would not believe in this community. And it was so difficult to try to get people to believe in the community um, that we ended up going to the churches because we thought, okay, they can't, they can't turn us down. I mean, they're churches, come on. And, and really, believe it or not, the churches um, started to talk up Muskegon. And we tried to create this buzz that there was opportunity and possibilities there. So it was been an incredibly long journey. And I don't want to spend much more time on that because I could, it was like 15 years, you know, so I, I have a, a hundred stories or I have hundreds of stories. So anyway, but what I do want to talk about is the reason we continue to care about this core city. Um, because it, it, even now, when I see how White Lake is growing and Norton Shores is growing, and a lot, I can remember this girl I went to in high school, and she said, I don't tell people I live in Whitehall. I tell I don't tell people I live north of Muskegon. I tell them I live northwest of Grand Rapids. And it's like, oh, my God, that is how I, the, pre, the president of Helmet at that time, I was in Lansing, and he was presenting Helmet, you know, to a huge, a huge crowd. And he never mentioned Whitehall or Muskegon. He said, I'm so happy to be living in Grand Haven. I mean, that's how horrible it was for our community to try to go from where we were into where we are today. But anyway, the bottom line is we've gone past that and we are past that people. And we need your help because there's still people that are stuck in 1985 or 1995 or 2000. And we have to get them to understand we are so far beyond that. We are creating something so amazing and so wonderful. And it really has to do once again with Muskegon Lake and the fact that we protected a lot of that heritage. Our arts and culture is second to none of any Lakeshore city. The diversity is also, we're going to be the only Lakeshore community that can have diverse people, right? There's no one that's going to touch us on that for another 50 years. And then now the economy is diverse. And that was really critical. So we have to have the mix of manufacturing and tourism, professional services. Look at our amazing healthcare system that we're building here. So I, I want to say, that, yeah, let's, let's, well, the former museum director told me to see the future, look at the past. So when we reflect on the past, we need to just learn from it and learn what about it was great and let's keep that going. And what about it wasn't so great and let's shed that and move on to the future. So I do wanna, make, hopefully we'll have time to talk about the future today um, and what that looks like. And hopefully everybody in this room is gonna help those people let go of the past, love it, enjoy it, but now it's about the future and it's now it's about the next generation and what can we do to help us for the next hundred years. Very good. <laughs> okay, so um, I, I have a different, a little bit of a different perspective than, than these two because I wandered into this town in 2013, and so I didn't get a chance to know about the, you know, the what it was and why it was and where it was. But I do remember, and some of you will laugh about this, but I do remember coming through about, you know, about three weeks before my job interview, and you know, I came through with a buddy who was a. Uh, downtown development director in a you know city that very vibrant downtown very popular place and we came through and we checked out the lake and we came around we came downtown and I remember we stopped I forget about where it was maybe about where 18th amendment is now and we were like what in the hell is wrong with these people like everything we saw around here said this should be the best the best city in in all of Michigan but it wasn't it clearly it clearly it was like, you know, you ever hear that story where like, you know, like if only God would throw me a lifeline. He's like, I did through all, all these things you and you weren't paying attention to them, right? And and it's like they had all these different op all these different options that nobody could create, right? We saw the art museum. It clearly had been around here a long time. We saw, we saw, you know, Muskegon Lake and, and Lake Michigan and all the, the great things, and but we couldn't get over, you know, but why could they not figure out a way to make it successful when people could go into 
downtown Fenton and have <laughs> and have a vibrant downtown, you know, or you name it, Royal Oak or 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 Sparta for crying out loud, and have a vibrant downtown. And for some reason, we didn't have one here. And um, it took a little while to figure that out, right? So I started in 2013, and to you know, like I said, there was no one room. There was no there was no Pigeon Hill. There was no there was no, there, there really wasn't a whole lot of any any real good reason to come downtown unless you were coming down to an event or if you worked downtown and things like that. And you know the the problem with that is um, that's when you really start losing your history, right? When people stop using the buildings, when people stop caring about what goes on in the buildings, when people stop taking care of the buildings, when there's not enough economy taking place in the buildings, it's really quickly that they can that they can fall into disrepair and and fall into a position where it doesn't make sense to invest in them economically, right? And, and then lose them. And we've lost a lot of buildings like that. Some probably we torn down on purpose, but others because they just economically they didn't they didn't work anymore. And um so as as a city manager, I really it, it became very apparent to me that like without a vibrant, successful downtown, it didn't matter what we do in our neighborhoods. It didn't matter what we do in a lot of the other places. Um, you look around and you see like, oh man, the schools aren't, you know, the schools aren't that good or the neighborhoods aren't that safe and this isn't that. And I, and I always came back and said, well, wait, they're not, those, the downtown isn't in its condition because of the quality of the schools. It's probably the opposite. Like our community is falling apart because we haven't made the right investments in our in our community itself in our downtown. And it's more of a that's a symptom or that's a you know that's that's like the after effect of of not being successful um, on the side where you were supposed to be successful. So so did we have great schools in 1990, 1980, 1970? We probably had pretty darn good schools. And um, what what did we not do as a community, as a city, to um, to help them continue to, to do that, right? By making the right investments in the right places. And um, so it was very clear to me that that we had to invest in our in our downtown, and whether it's a convention center or reimagining what an arena would look like and things like that. One of the things that I found out really quickly was you know invite in, invite somebody in to talk about a book or or, or people to know about it downtown. If you lived in Michigan and you were, I don't know, under 50 or whatever, you probably had no idea what a vibrant downtown was like because a lot of our downtowns, if you lived in Michigan, our vibrant downtowns disappeared a long time ago, right? It wasn't just Muskegon. It was it was the stories of the people that could talk about what it was like in Flint and Detroit and Lansing and all these places. A lot of those people are gone now, right? A lot of those people are, you know, they're well old, they're, you know, they're well beyond retirement age, right? And um so if we're then you're looking at a guy like like Frank Peterson at the time, 30 some years old, what should we do downtown? I don't know. I grew up in Flint. My downtown was pretty <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it was nice at one point, you know. Um, and then I came here from Battle Creek and they didn't have a really nice downtown either. They had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of employees down down there. And um, and really what it, what what I think started pushing us forward were people finally starting to step up and say, well, what would, what, no, now what makes the downtown vibrant? What, what would make me want to be down there, right? And then we focus a lot of stuff on it. Like, hey, it turns out like a nice brewery made people want to be down there, right? Cool housing made people want to, want to be down there. Events made people want to be down there. And we really started focusing and, and, and Cindy can test that, focusing on, on doing those things that even were almost too young for us, right? Like I felt like I was still a, a spry young, person but it was like no 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 this isn't even about me i'm too old now like if we want to rebuild this downtown we got to figure out what the 20 somethings want to do and because they're the ones that are going to help make this thing vibrant for the next 40 years and um and that's why i see a lot of the things that are that are going on downtown really are there there's almost two folks right there's this youth focus and then there's this like almost almost like baby boomer focus because we know they got the you know they got the cash to, <laughs> to buy the night the nicer condos so we get the condo built at least right and, um, and we started focusing on those things. But, but I, I do want to turn the attention a little bit because one thing that I was brought in to talk about a little bit was, was from a future standpoint, like outside, outside of government. And I'll say, um, one thing I always noticed as I looked in our neighborhoods, and I do live, I live in a beautiful old house on Jefferson Street, built in 1917. One thing that always kind of jumped out to me, and like as I looked at all the cool spots around town, 
um, that I think we got to start thinking about now is um, what are the structures of significance that aren't 100 years old around here? And why didn't we build them if they don't exist, right? So it's easy. You can go back, look, look at the Hackney New Home. Those are from the 1800s. Look at the Hackney Building. It's from the 1800s. Check out Jefferson Street. Frank's house was built in 1917, and there were some built at the turn of the century. There were some cool ones built in 1920s, and then you can find some neat buildings that were built in the 1930s, and maybe you can find some 40s and early 50s stuff, maybe like as far over as um, Glenside and stuff. And then, well, what's the building of significance that we're saving that we want to rally behind that was built in the 70s? And which one was built in the 80s? Which one was built in the 90s? And, and I wonder if, if our boom and bust mentality and, and the things that we missed when we were having downtime, we didn't, we have potentially decades where we didn't, where either we didn't do things of significance or we they already they were built and then just and destroyed so quickly that they never got to a point where we recognize how significant they are. You know, one building that that I always point out that 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 I think is important in saving is like, for example, the SPX building on um, on on the lake, right? It's all it's a it's a cool building. It's it represents a significant time in our lives, but is it significant? I don't know, right? I mean, it was built in 1989. It's different than everything else we see around there. What about City Hall? It's ugly as you could ever ask it to be, but is it significant? I don't know. I, I don't know. And be. and and a lot of people, when they made the decisions, right? People voted. We all learned that now. Now that we got this exhibit here, people voted, and and the people voted to tear down a lot of these buildings downtown. Did they just not think they were significant at that time? And so, as we're looking to redevelop our downtown, and we're picking out buildings that are worth saving and stuff. Remember, there might have been that building that was built in 1960, 1970, 1980 that we don't realize is significant yet. And, um, and we might not. But if we tear it down now, I guarantee you, your great grandkids are going to be like, I can't believe those idiots tore down that building. They're going to be, they'll have a slideshow of it up here. <laughs> and then the Speaking City Hall will come by and they're going, they tore that down. There's one just like that. And, and you know, and, and you got to remember that, that like when we tore some of these things down, when the, you know, the big we, we didn't think they were significant back then, and that's why you got to keep your your eyes open and in, in your in your um in your mind open to what's to what is significant. And then the next step is when we're building stuff today, let's make sure that we keep that that we think about that. Like like it can't always be like how do we build the most affordable housing all the time because that is important. But wait a minute, will somebody want to walk by that in seventy years from now and 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 see it as a significant piece in one of our neighborhoods? I don't know. Um, but we got to remember that when, when we're building houses and we're building convention centers and building new libraries or new high schools, a good example, right? We got great, beautiful new middle school going up. Will anybody ever say that's significant? I don't know. It's probably not. It doesn't look like any of the significant buildings that the school owns, you know, right now, or the one that Wheelfish owns, um, the Hackley Edmund building that the school owned, owned for a lot of time that, you know, when you look at it, it's worth saving. And, um, I think that's 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 the next thing that's going to be really important is is how do we make sure that as we're building our city, you know, we think that we found out, um, you know, this, the great things are yet to come. How do we make sure that, that as we build those great things that we're building things that 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 will want to be here a hundred years from now, and we'll beg people not to tear them down a hundred years from now, and we'll hope that you know, and we'll hope that they that they don't and they see the value in them and carry them for a long time. I think that's a great point. I'll just jump on that because I do feel like because of these issues with the housing shortage and the supply chain issues that they are rushing to put up just, uh, you know, junk. And, and it's, and yeah, I'm sorry, but you may have to live with your relatives or in the basement just a little bit longer uh, because of just what you said, because those, that housing just may not last. And then we'll have another set of problems like 20 years from now. So also, and we were part of, I was part of that group that um, with the chamber, the community foundation, Paul C. Johnson, that bought that set where the mall was, right? And so people, we only had one mission and, and that was let's build quality. So we made it, we required everyone in that area to use brick and to, you know, have certain heights and, you know, they had to, so in every, everything had to be approved. We didn't really even care what was in the building as long, as long as those were quality buildings and they weren't doing pole barns and things like that, which, which people were proposing. They were proposing pole barn type style architecture for the downtown. And so luckily we, we got it, I think, to the point where that's now more of a standard with the city. And I think the city doesn't allow a pole barn downtown. 
So um, nothing against pole barn, yeah. not the townships. Um, <laughs> but um, anyway, so yeah, just I think that's a really important point as we go forward is to look at the quality of everything that we're doing. Let me uh, point out a couple of uh, ideas about the future. First off, I would uh, propose that uh, the future is being built right in our midst. Let's just take a survey of what's going on in our waterfront right now. We have Harbor 31 down where Continental Motors used to be at. That's $130 million uh, mixed-use development. Um, we have Adelaide Point at the other end of our downtown, um, down where um, the end of Western Avenue is, um, where Michigan Steel, help me with before that. Anaconda. Anaconda, that area down there. Um, $240 million as we speak going up. And hopefully we'll be able to get out there before the end of the year and see uh, that mixed use development. Cross Street, Shaw Walker building. Um, uh, another uh, probably $220 million. We should be seeing uh, renovations begin in the first phase of that uh, yet this uh, um, late summer, early fall. Um, moving out towards uh, Lake Michigan, we've got a uh, Windward Point. We all know is a sappy paper mill site. I can't see that being anything less than $500 million if Parkland Development were to actually build out what they have uh, proposed uh, um, for uh, that particular piece of property. And then finally, uh, it's been stalled, but uh, it won't be stalled forever. And that is at the um, uh, old uh, Pigeon Hill, the second half of the property, which the first half is uh, Harbor Town. The second half would be the docks. Um, you're looking at another $240 million worth of uh, development, mainly residential, mixed with uh, recreational because of, of the water aspects, but then also sprinkled in with uh, commercial aspects of that. That's $1.3 billion. You know, it's happening. Uh, some of them are going up. Some of them are already being lived in. Um, an amazing transformation that's going on. Future is being built before us. Um, the one that I didn't mention um, that I would uh, point to is the Mark Doc. Uh, something that um, you signed, uh, Frank, uh, as a city uh, with the McKees and the Sand Products Company was a, uh, a letter of understanding uh, in which uh, we would be transforming that into a mixed-use uh, recreational residential uh, property, commercial property, and that the heavy, uh, heavier industry of ships and uh, warehousing would be moving to the east side of the lake. Um, I see, and it's something that uh, my friend in uh, uh, the late uh, John McGarry uh, had always dreamed of having would be having the LST 393 and the USS Silversides sitting side by side at that location downtown. And I still think that that is being discussed. We'll see how past uh, uh, grievances uh, are ironed out and so that people can start working together and make some of that happen. But it is it's something that is realistically on the boards. And then finally, as I look at all those elements, I will know, I hope I'm still alive, uh, that we have made it when we have a water taxi system in uh, our downtown and on Muskegon Lake. Okay, um, been to Chicago a number of times sailing. And if you're in the Monroe Harbor, you've got the uh, the uh, buoy tenders out there pushing you along um, the shoreline. But even more so is if you go to Toronto, you have to the island, there is a really nice ferry system. It's just a pontoon boat that moves you from point to point along that harbor. But probably the most impressive one I've seen is in the inner harbor of Baltimore, in which you are moving from point to point to point um, throughout that uh, urban waterfront community. There's probably about 10 stops and there's like three or four of them and they're continually going. We could do a couple down here. Uh, we tried it once. We tried to have a water taxi across the back of John Baltimore and uh, the folks at the Great Lakes um, Dock Material tried putting a um, uh, pontoon boat between North Muskegon and uh, Muskegon with a channel that lasted about a year, didn't last, but ahead of its time, it will be in our future. It is one of the things that the city put together in its um, master plans for the future to, uh, to begin working on and begin planning for. Um, I dream of the day that that's actually viable and operating. Well, another thing, so we're on the future thing now. So um, definitely you're going to see those housing, the neighborhoods. Remember, 50% of us are going to work from our homes. And even more than that, maybe just going two days a week into Grand Rapids or Lansing or flying to Chicago. So definitely um, our, our airports can be really critical in the future because that may be a commuter airport. 
And so people are going to still want to live by the water. So creating one of our past strengths is the neighborhoods and the fact that we have all these interesting and unique neighborhoods, and we need to continue that, building up the old ones, filling them in, as our city is a leader on that right now to have infill housing. But now these new neighborhoods that are going to be on SAPI and just what you've talked about, we have to make them true neighborhoods where people can walk. The trails are going to be critical. Uh, a lot of people will have electric bikes, right? So all of the trail system, the way we move around is going to be very, very different, especially when we're working from our homes the majority of the time. So uh, then connecting that, of course, to the water and all of the boats and all the types of boat travel that we have going into the future. I could stop right there, but you want to add on future? No. Future well, we, well, we, you want to start? You want to help engage us here? We uh, have any questions for our call? <laughs> I wonder if there's uh, data in terms of population growth, um, people moving here from Chicago. I saw something in the news today or yesterday. Uh, uh, that I'm curious how that looks and the quality of scale developments going on. Discussion and article that I saw said, well, Muskegon is just an extension of the Chicago, uh, the, well, yeah. people in the north. So, yeah. so, so my guess is. To, to get a good answer for that, they're gonna you're gonna have to wait till the next census. I mean, that's that's uh, my cop out answer, in part because, you know, between the censuses, everything else is just an estimate, and a lot of it is is they don't really pay that close attention to what's going on in the in the core city. So all they're outside of us counting and talking to people and understanding those things, you know, we won't really get to see really good, really good, accurate numbers. And we saw that with the last census, right? They were off on a couple of a couple of the measurements. Um, uh, for for our growth, but I, but I will say anecdotally, you see it, right? You definitely, you absolutely see it. The number of people that I've met that are here, um, from from out of state, especially in the you know the I would say the suburban Chicago area, there's there are quite a few of them that are that are now calling Muskegon home. They're coming here because of quality of life's a little bit better in terms of like the ability to get from place to place without being stuck in traffic. Um, housing is. Things we we look at as very expensive. Some of those folks are looking at as as bargains, <laughs> you know, as perspective, right? And um, you know, we're in a good spot because we also have we could people can start here as vacationers. And I uh, you know there's concern right now about Airbnbs and stuff like that, but a lot of people that call Muskegon home today started off by vacationing here. Um, and then, and, you know, that might have been in a, somebody else's cottage, right? Um, or an air, what we would call Airbnb now, um, and then became a vacation home that was theirs. And now, you know, as a, as a, as a year round resident. The only data I do have is, as you said, the data is that we do know from Comcast that a lot of the real estate is being bought by people with Illinois addresses. So that's the one bit of it. Well, Comcast. People who are buying real estate and they're signing up for Comcast, the bills are going to Illinois. So, so we do know that as a fact, which we thought was quite interesting. Marketing-wise, we're targeting Grand Rapids as well as Chicago. So behind the scenes, market because obviously Grand Rapids, you don't have to switch jobs. And Chicago, again, it's going to be that great, that history that we have connected to Chicago is still there today. The families that are three, four generations coming here for vacation. Do you think the city is going to enact a prohibition against um, short term leasing? I will just tell you, going back to uh, City Commission after we're done here, on the agenda tonight is a pause of six months on any new um, applications for short term rentals within residential areas, only zoned residential. So you could be in the downtown. You could be along um, the commercial district of Lakeside on uh, Lakeshore Drive. Um, you would still be able to uh, invest and uh, create um, space in buildings either above uh, the commercial or as part of uh, the commercial uh, structure on the street level, um, short-term rentals. So it is in our future. It is where we're at. We are trying to see um, what um, is the best way 
to control the balance of uh, private investment in the use of your own property, along with the need of the community and its neighbors and the neighborhoods to have some stability and um, a neighborly atmosphere so that you know who is living next door. They're living next door next year. They lived next door last year, and it's just not a continual transient. So um, that is very important to a vast number of the people who have spoken to us. And uh, we'll see where the vote is tonight on that. But one way or the other, we are looking at ways of uh, limiting uh, the explosive growth, especially on the west end of the city uh, because of the water resources that are there. But I understand that there is a changing uh, rules, regulations, and laws uh, being sought out in legislatures and in the courts across the United States about this. And um, some of this will be dictated to us as to what we can or cannot do as a community as it relates to uh, short-term rentals. And I would like to see Frank's My understanding on what's going on. Yeah, I have no idea what those people are doing. Um, I'm out of there. Um, I don't. I don't know. I was. I don't. I don't want to. I, I was a big fan of of letting the letting the market dictate it. Right, and those same neighborhoods weren't. Those weren't those same neighborhoods that people are worried aren't aren't accessible because Airbnbs are buying them up. They weren't accessible to ninety percent of the skiing population before that. Anyway, a lot of them. They didn't go up for sale, um, and you know they were pretty expensive. Um, I think that one thing the Airbnb market did for that neighborhood was finally get people to sell their houses on on the open market, and uh, you know, and get some competition in there. And and no longer, I mean, it wasn't that long ago we were having houses selling, uh, you know, staring at at Pier Marquette for a couple hundred thousand dollars, and that sounds that sounds really good, except that when you know that. And we kind of count on that the economic growth and the economic power of our of our you know vibrant areas to help pay for you know you know to help pay for a city that maybe has a lot of people in it that maybe don't have you know those kind of tax that tax and ability. So um, I, I don't know. I'm 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 worried that it that it could slow down a potential potential growth and really we probably could have looked at other we probably should have been ahead of this when we tried to get ahead of it. It seemed like five years ago. When we were asking for some simple changes and there wasn't there wasn't enough you know people on the council didn't think we should make those changes back then it probably would have been impactful today you know have you know five years later so we'll see what they do um and um i guess yeah I guess if you live next door to one you probably don't love it and, but if you come here to vacation a lot you probably actually do love it or if you have a house that you want to uh upgrade or, or move uh, into that kind of a realm, um, um, you want that, you would like that option. And there are obviously those in the investment in real estate area um, that are on the opposite side of that conversation. Yeah, I'll give you a, a, a super quick, not related to Muskegon, but we're doing, my company, we've got a big project going on in Detroit and we were shy on labor over there and we had employees here that we trusted. And so instead of going there and procuring labor, um, we sent a group of eight guys over there to work and um, went into, you guys know Highland Park? Highland Park is not a super vibrant area. They have dozens and dozens of Airbnbs there and they're people who are over there working for, you know, for a long period of time. So I rented four months of an Airbnb in a house that these people probably bought for $20,000, fixed up, finally got a house fixed up on the block and we're paying them $6,000 a month to house these housing people there. I mean, it's a real opportunity for economic impact in a community when you allow these these sorts of things. And we and we rent that rate on, on, on the Airbnb market. Um, and and when we're building big things here, Sativa, you name it, the hotels can't handle them all because they're trying to deal with tourists all winter, you know, and you know, all summer long. And those houses Outside of the families that they that they bring in and out of these communities, they they house sometimes they house hundreds of workers throughout the throughout the year that are important in, in, in building things in our in our community. Yeah, take a All right. Let's speak up. Um, yes. I know this is a hard question, probably to answer, especially with all of the development that's happening on the lake shore. 
you know, from the Fidget Mill property all the way down to Harbor 31. But what percentage do you think we are in, in completing that, that rebirth of downtown? And I know that uh, along the lakeshore is a huge percentage, but the rest of what we all think of as downtown is just the main drag, if you will. I mean, how much more do we need to get there to be developed? I, mean, I would say you're never there. That should be the, <laughs> that should be what it is, right? Like our city should be growing and evolving every single day. So um, we should never like be like, oh yeah, we're halfway there. Once we get this last building done, we're in good shape. I would say that it should be like a ne almost a never ending process. It should be this idea that we're going to continue to add the right things at the right times forever. And probably the hard part about it is we really we see that the day you stop, it's really hard to get started again. And then you start decaying from that point forward. So it's really got to be viewed as like a, as a nonstop thing. But I will say this, we've come so far that it feels like we've come a long way, right? It feels like we got to be getting pretty darn close. No. But I would say, yeah, I mean, there could be 30 more stores downtown, you know, right? There could be, there could be 50 more stores downtown. There could be 500 more apartments downtown. And so I would say, it's, you know, one building at a time, there's probably an infinite number of years it'll take to get to get done and we still won't be done. Yeah, and uh, we should never take it for granted. And maybe that is what happened at one time because there was so much prosperity. People just took it for granted. And, and communities, when they die, they die slow but they die faster than it takes them to rebuild. So, you know, you can go down real fast and then it takes them twice as long to rebuild it. And the, I, I was thinking 80%, we're like, let's always stay at like 80% um, because then we'll always feel like there's a little bit more, but still here where we are now, which maybe like be 50, 60, it still scares me. It still makes me nervous that we could slip back the other way because of a pandemic, you know, things that are totally out of our control. Mm -hmm. We need to get solid enough and deep enough roots that we can know we're secure and then that we can ride it for another hundred years. Chris, uh, simply on the waterfront, we're a quarter of the way. 25 seconds. Yeah. I mean, just take a look at the, yeah. at the, the, the immensity of the sites that we have that we are working on. Uh -huh. And don't you think that's something that we as a community forget that when the mall closed and, and then all of a sudden that left this big void, right? Oh. Well, when that was all building, what I, we had Teledyne and Lakey and Anaconda. I mean, that was all that was all filled in, right? So so now when the mall's gone and then all of those are gone, too, then you have this vast canvas, right, to, to develop. So Plenty of room. And I think that we forget that, that those businesses were there for so long. And there are people that and we're doing a branding um, exercise uh, and project at City. Uh, and I've done lots of interviews or sat through lots of focus groups the last couple of months. And there is a real longing. And it's just not with people my age and older, but it's with uh, my kids or my grandkids' age um, that want this all this development that I just mentioned here to cease. I want, I don't want that kind of change. There are things that that is taking away from the charm or the beauty of, of Muskegon. And they would not see a development uh, on um, the Sappy site as being beautiful. I think it could be. That's my vision, but it's I the beholder, right? Um they um they they, they feel like if we rapidly move too quickly in this direction, we are taking away what we really love about our community. So there, there is a real push and a pull amongst um, the electorate, amongst our residents, and um, those who are care deeply about the community. I want to add that there's something else that makes this community extremely vibrant. And it's, you mentioned it briefly, it's our arts and culture scene. Um, think about what's here. We have a fabulous theater in the Brown Hall, beautifully restored. We have um, the, the, a marvelous symphony that is recognized all over as really a very quality symphony. You've mentioned the three ships, well, two of the three, and the clipper in that mix. Um, there are all kinds of possibilities about what can happen as combination museum for those three. The fabulous stuff going on at the art museum. Wow. And then where you're sitting, right. the Lakeshore right. Museum Center group of museums. Yes, I'm rather partial to one of the three, but 
I'm, you know, I love these too. And the exciting possibilities for things that can um, help make this facility and all of the other services and all the other things that are available to us as far as arts and cultures in the community. Um, that certainly is a draw for people and it's a draw for, for vacationers as well. Think about the impact the cruise ships not only have had on, on the museums, but the reason they're here is because of what's going on right now. It's exciting, it's fabulous, it's fun. And it's, I think, a very important part of what's going on in this community. So I was involved very early. I was the first broker for Heritage Square Townhomes. I opened up the Century Club and I uh, did, brought Unruly Brewing in. And during that time for the Century Club, I met with Mrs. Howard from Potters. She was closing her store. And I said to her, why don't you let us set up a booth and sell all your inventory here? She said, well, I'll think about it. I think I'm just going to sell it to one person and be done. And she said to me, as we stood in the ballroom of the Century Club, Muskegon will never come into its own. Mm -hmm. I said to her, you know, we won't as long as people like you <laughs> hold on to that theory. You have to tell the story the way you want it to be told. And she looked at me. She said, you're right. I'll never say that again. <laughs> so to your first comment, we have to tell people what's here. We have to tell our story the way we want it to be told. We have to tell it loudly. And loudly. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But we have to not be afraid of change. Yes, that's right. It's going yeah. to change. Yeah. Muskegon is a living thing. Yeah. And if it doesn't change, it's done. Yeah. Those are the two choices. Uh, my name's Steve. I came here a year and a half ago with my wife, never intending to end up in Muskegon. So I, I have a perspective just having dropped, and I work with home. I work uh, for a company in Los Angeles, so we traded one West Coast for another West Coast. And, uh, you know, it kept us here. We, we, were, we thought we'd be in Holland, but um, it just so happened we, we ended up here in, in Muskegon. Uh, we have an Airbnb. And uh, we thought that's all we were going to do in Muskegon is have an Airbnb. But we fell in love with the city. We fell in love with the people, what's going on. So this is coming from an outsider who just moved, you know. And so it's happening. People see it. Yeah. People feel it. We did. Just walking around downtown. We like, this is great. And so we ended up moving downtown. And we, You know, I can walk here now. So um, well, I love it. I think it's great. And, and uh, whatever you guys are doing, it's working. So. <laughs> I, I was doing a tour, um, Steve, and uh, a group, a gentleman my age said, who's moving into all of these houses? <laughs> Where's the factory that they're working at? That's old thing. Uh, we do not have the Saturn factory coming to town to create Spring Hill, Tennessee for us. Okay? Um, uh, we do have industrial, it's still industrial sector. Advanced manufacturing is still a key um part of our of our countywide employment but it's people like this who are moving in um your wife works for a, a, a sustainable interior design company and um so uh, they can work in our beautiful community and they have brought their perspective their wealth to us and it is being repeated across this county um every day every week every month these are the types of people that are moving into the accommodations that we are providing and as the service industry increases the hospitality industry takes even more of a foothold um, we have to have the affordable side along with a more upscale or luxury side it has to be a blend of both for us to be successful and i think i think right now we are doing it fairly well let's go here I'm sorry, I apologize, I'm blind. Um, I just wanted to follow on his footnote because I followed my parents up here. They came up five years ago to retire. We're supposed to retire in Holland and found property up here and decided to fall in love with the city. Started pulling me and my siblings up here during the summer with our kids. Um, I followed a few years ago and built the house last year and decided that I needed to pull my sister and built, she built the house now. 
which she plans to do Airbnb with, but she hasn't gotten there yet. She's too in love with it right now. She <laughs> so we're going to let her decide that one. But the whole aspect of the entire city, both during the summer and the winter, is very uneven at this moment for visitors. And I think that's something that we think needs to be looked into. In the summertime, you have quite a few options, party in the parks, um, heritage landing, uh, the Irish Fest at the end of this summer, the Muskegon, um, the Harley Fest, the summer um, farmer's market, just things that continuously pull in the arts and crafts fairs. Two summers ago, you did the sidewalk fair for the kids where they could actually watch the artists and do their own sidewalk mm -hmm. talk. Things like that are phenomenal. There's not quite an interaction ability in the wintertime. And that's something that I'm I'm looking forward to is going forward. Hopefully there's something in the plans. Something that needs to be done. Don't you think that we as a community in this EU, you could probably help and Judy, you might have some comment too, but I think we see a lot more of those indoor activities for families within our organizations and our institutions with yes. programs that the art museum is putting on programs that the lecture museum center are doing for families of multiple different ages i mean just a, a program like this tonight we didn't have this kind of a program five years ago four years ago that we as a community could come to so i think that they're out there but obviously not as prevalent as we see them in the summertime just because of the true temperature you know that that we deal with right yeah Oops, we got a question here. Unless you want to oh, on the and maybe you can't answer this, but I think one of the things that you said is, you know, there's still a group of people here that want to connect with the past or don't like the development that's happening. And I just didn't know if you had any insight as to why that is. Because everything that I hear is good and positive, but yet we know that there is a group of people that are digging their heels in for whatever reason, but I don't even understand what some of Most of it is to nature, and it is to... Um, how we um, handle the um, stewardship of our waterfront. It is to the, um, they look at other communities and we they don't want to become a hollow. They don't want to become a Grand Haven. Uh, whatever that means in their mind, but they, these are the things that they are are verbalizing. Um, and, and it's, um, they where they had a solitude of being able to walk through a piece of property, they do not want that disrupted with development, with more people. Um, they, they, they want that aspect. But as we say, if we do that, we're only going to be going backwards. Yeah. It's, it's funny, too, you know, not to beat up on everybody, but like the same people that are like, I, I, I want more neighbors instead of Airbnbs are the same where they're going, but don't go any more houses, you know, and it's like, we're crying out loud, you know, we can. These things could work together instead of against each other if we just would open our eyes a little bit. Yeah, and so, and don't forget social media plays a role, right? So one person says something and then another person, you know, and then people jump on that without really, really thinking it all the way through. And then you get them in a meeting like this and they do start to think it through and then they'll start to change their opinion. Well, I'm just thinking of a conversation I had with a young woman. She was probably early 30s. I mean, she had a, um, a master's degree from Harvard um she came back to town she is here uh, her parents are still here um and um, it, there's just a certain aspect of the community that she doesn't want to lose that she remembered growing up and she feels it being slowly taken away as i list the number of yeah. hundred million dollar projects that we have on the boards or in going into the ground um, scary um, disquieting um unsettling uh, for her, because um, she, her 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 vision growing up was of um, carefree days on the beach and and in the woods and in the dunes, and they're all going to be overrun by people and buildings that I'd rather not have there. I mean, that was the impression I got of a very um, caring, compassionate, passionate, uh, very smart lady, um, and she holds that very deep in terms of of where she sees the development cycle going. And do you have a question? Oh, no, we'll get to it there and then back there. And I read a year or so ago about 
that fall to was that it would be able to acquire any silver muskie. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think that's that's at this point it doesn't appear to be their front project for Grand Rapids. So um, everybody in Grand Rapids seems to be focused on other things. I don't. I, I don't say that it would never happen here, but it will only happen here if the Grand Rapids community wants it to happen here. So we're not going to be able to pull it here. We can't but, pull a 150 to 250 million dollar aquarium, and that's what you're talking about to have it a destination. Yeah, but they can, and if they decide that Muskegon is close enough to Grand Rapids where they would like to have an aquarium, that's when it'll happen. It's going to have to be a public-private partnership again. And the public side is going to talk about bonding and, and millages. And, uh, you know, we we will raise uh, 20 cents here on, on whatever mill we put out. They'll raise a buck. They just have a much greater economic base to support something like that. And where if this project were ever to go, they were looking at Millennium Park, which is on the west side of the city, um, as, as a possible uh, location for it. Um, the one that was uh, discussed here most recently was the east side of uh, um, the Sappy site, Windward Point. And John Rooks, if he was to uh, obtain that property and start development, would be open to looking at using a portion of the east side of that property, which would be towards Lakeside, um, for that. But I, I don't see it happening. And uh, we do not, I personally think we have more uh, important um, things that we can put those kinds of public resources towards than that. Um, so, and, yeah. and I covered it when it was, and you were around here too. It was discussed out at the uh, uh, river. Um, one was discussed down on the Martok and uh, <laughs> it's been kicked around here for 25, 30 years. I actually went out and, for a product reporter, did some reporting on some aquariums across uh, the upper Midwest. And um, it, it never has really taken hold. And um, it, it's an expensive, very expensive, uh, but could be very dynamic. Well, that I think that you kind of were leading toward, we have something that would be equal to that. We could move all of the historic maritime vessels into the downtown area. That would be equal to an aquarium and create a whole plaza that is an outdoor walking maritime museum um, in our downtown. And that would be just as wonderful. And why not? We don't have to do um, do the aquarium. We can do something of our own that's all Muskegon. Yeah, I, the thing is, when we moved here five years ago, when I was about two retired and came into the area and whatnot, I got the impression that there wasn't this, I've got my, we don't want you coming in here. Like they're getting, we're hearing that more. Yeah. And that's one thing that will kill your downtown, your community, yeah. and everything else. Because the downtown itself has to feed on something. Like we had the industry before, and the people that were working in that industry and whatnot used the downtown. And to the point that they thought it was worthwhile to build a mall. And I don't know what happened with that mall, that mall that ended up with the double line that built the mall out there. We had another area of this hospitality and vacation stuff that was coming on and the support for the guy <laughs> who was strange that they looked at bringing the casino one of the casinos up here which made all the sense in the world to me because it gave you something else that could add jobs and positions and the rest of it and the activity that brought people to the area to look at it just like him and like myself came here to visit and then wanted to become be part of the community because we enjoyed it. That activity that would come in with the use of the casino and the rest of it, and I don't know why the city hasn't gotten behind to push that because the rest of the white city. That to me makes more sense as far as your development is concerned than anything else. And would open up it wouldn't put any pressure on your lakefront, but it would sure fill in a lot of the units and you're looking for the development. You want to do it or you want to be there was a big proposal on that in the late 90s, right? Yeah, and I, I, locally, there's not a lot we can do because that's regulated by the state and federal government. You know, they say that we can do something, but locally we can't. But I personally think that we also have to look to the future. That whole industry is changing. Now that you can do stuff online, right. that industry may go by the wayside. 
Um, there may be other things like this gaming that the young people do. They're doing this three-dimensional gaming and they go to places to do that in a real visual way. So even that now, as we look at this technology revolution that we're living in right now, even how our world's going to look 10 years from now with AI, stuff like that may go by the wayside. So it's really unknown where we are, which is why we do need to focus on the youth, because they're going to have a better handle on what arts and entertainment looks like, you know, 10, 20 years from now. I wrote my first um, Indian casino story for downtown in 1992. Okay, Hasn't happened yet. And it won't happen downtown. Uh, the one place it may happen is at the old racetrack. Okay, now what did we do there as a community, folks? We got in at the end of the racetrack era. Yeah. And that lasted five years in bust. I would say we've missed the uh, window of opportunity for casinos. And as much as uh, we may think that that would be a great thing, um, we, are, we are taking the gaming industry in other directions. And um, to have a large casino footprint with a hotel and um, a uh, entertainment venue um, is probably not what uh, is, is, is out there. We were late also, uh, quite truthfully, on the suburban mall. I mean, look how many towns across the state of Michigan had suburban malls. When we put in the Lakes Mall, there were only 11 of them built that year across the United States. There were two the next year and there were zero the year after that. We were at the end of that era, too, and, and it worked well for us for 20 years, but now we're in the boat with everybody else. Uh, I, I really um, think that we've gone beyond the point in time when uh, that would be a viable future now, now economic let's, let's activity. Let's say now about what we were ahead on is the environment and taking care of our environment and cleaning up our waterways, and we were ahead of everybody else on that. We were ahead on appreciating the outdoors with all of the state parks and the local and the county parks that we, we were also ahead. ahead on putting in infrastructure in terms of our roads or sewers. Um, we are we are in a position to handle uh, our capacity is such greater than some of our neighbors around us who are suffering through issues of infrastructure capacity. Um, so yes, we have been ahead on a number of issues and and the cleanup of uh, Muskegon Lake is. Uh, is one of the, the stars that started when we put in the wastewater site, uh, the wastewater plant um, facility in 1973. I think we had a question over there. No, one more question after that. The is very lucky as a city that we have such a vibrant future, but we also have a very vibrant past. As we move forward, do you think it's important that we consider and develop and represent and recognize that past throughout? Great museums. I mean, Muskegon is so lucky to have multiple, both maritime and land based, wonderful yeah. museums. Yeah. Do you think it's important to recognize and uh, showcase those? Yeah, events? well, I will I will speak to that because I, I'm part of the cruise ship initiative. It's not a tons and thousands of people that come to on the cruise ships, but it's a few thousand people every year. And that is the number one thing that we focus. And that is something that we take for granted. We have this amazing walkable historic district. And these people come from all over the world. They have been everywhere. And when they come here and we take them down Western Avenue and we turn down Webster Avenue and we go all the way around and they stop at those museums, they are in awe. And they have even said, is this real? They think they're at um, Greenfield Village, you know, <laughs> or, or Jamestown or whatever. They they, um, they they don't realize this is a real neighborhood with real museums and real people live in these houses. That's how <laughs> magical it is. We drive by it every day and just say, oh, it's another neighborhood. No, it's really, really magical. And I think the more we can really, really build on that and build, incorporate these institutions and keep it going with the beautification, which Frank's been a leader on the flower beds and the, the landscaping with, mixed with any quality building. I, it, it's really something. I get to see it from the eyes of outsiders every year. And it's just, it's so fun to see how they light up, to see this very, very unique place in their minds. And so, yes, it's super important. And, and one of the things that I remember early on in the um, bringing of the cruise ships in, and we would go in and talk to them and welcome them and, and, and chat with them and all uh, for their day here. Um, the one word they used, you have a beautiful city. 
I'm sorry. I love this town, but that would not be the first word coming out of my mouth when I thought of Muskegon. Okay, it just isn't. But that is a perception from the outside because we are clean. And yes, Frank, uh, we have cleaned up the. Uh, I remember doing a tour with it. I think you probably had a tour too. That we were around looking at what we need to clean up, and we just all went in the trolley, and it was like, okay, check them off. And and we have taken care of the blighted aspects to the point that somebody comes into town for the first time and says, it's a beautiful, clean city. I'm going, thank you very much. <laughs> and yes, um, to the history part, and um, uh, Melissa will be uh, representing us at the county board on Thursday. Um, and there are some very, very uh, exciting plans for this institution. I am on the board along with Ann and some others. And uh, we do recognize the need to take into the future uh, into the next decades, uh, our presentation of our tremendous history. And um, I think that's something that we were going to be asking the philanthropic community and we'll be asking the uh, um, taxpayers, quite truthfully, of Muskegon County to support us with going forward. If uh, if you believe in that, please come along our journey and, uh, and help us out. We had... Uh... Well, there's one last question in the back there. You'd probably spend all day here chatting, I think. Uh, go ahead, Council. So, um, Frank, I, I want to start with you because when you came here in 2013, you were 37. So, is that what you said? I was 32. I was 32. Oh, look at this is better, right? Sure. So, what's the, and for all three of you, but Frank specifically, what do you think is the number one thing that we need to do to, to attract? people that were younger, that are younger than you were in 2013. If that's really our future and we need to get those folks in into, into the city, what is it that we need to do in our downtown specifically to? Yeah, well, so that's a hard one for me because I'm not them, right? And like, like I said, I think you gotta be able to put yourself in their mind and have the things that they want to have there. So that's the number one thing. I just, I just don't know that I'm qualified to do it. Um, but yeah, you got to have things there that those people want to come, come and, and enjoy. So for me, I, I like going to the hockey games, but for them, it might, it might be completely something else. But I will say this, perception is like, is everything. So like what we need is vibrancy down there. We need people talking about it in a vibrant and happy way. And, you know, and the number one thing we can do is, is, is say good things about our downtown, show up at when our downtown needs us come to the events where people expect there to be a lot of people at and make sure there are a lot of people at them. And, and the kids will want to be part of it. Like people want to be part of something that's, that's seen as going like this. Um, and, and I think that those would be the key things and, and what those things are. I, like, I don't know, it's like, it could be a lot of stuff that we're not, that, that, that I'm not normally interested, but I'll go, but I'll go to it. You know, like I, like, like they brought in the, um, the professional soccer and I wasn't really a soccer fan, but now I go to those games and they're, and they're they're about as there's just as fun if not more fun than the hockey games are. And I would have never known if I didn't just go down and give it a try with my kids. I I, I do have an answer to that. Is that is we, meaning me, uh, we need to step aside. You know, it's time to step aside because if those thirty somethings are really leading. Um, they're going to know, just as Frank said, they know what the cool stuff is. They know what these things are that I don't even know what my kids are talking about. Um, mm -hmm. But we need to be around and they need to still listen to us because we made mistakes, right? And we don't want them to make the same mistakes that we made. So we need to stick around and be engaged, but we need to go ahead and let them lead and make those decisions. And we just you know, hope that they're, you know, what they're doing and what they're talking about. For the longest time, there weren't any buildings for them to even try something in. So, I mean, if you were to ask me, I was like, number one thing we could do is have buildings built that people can go and do and do the things they want to do in them that they think will be profitable. And that was our problem for so many years. It's yeah. like, hey, I want to open up this store. It's going to be awesome. Where can I do it? And There's it wasn't. No place. Well, hold on. We're going to build your building. Just give us 18 to 24 months and then you can open and I also think as a community, we beat ourselves up a lot. The building of the downtown mall was a good idea at the time, and it worked. It was successful. It was successful for two decades or more, and then it isn't because you have to change. You got to change. Go back to our, our our friends and neighbors that don't want any change because they like this place the way it is. It's going to die if there's not change. 
The mall was a great idea. I think the people at that time, I'm amazed at what they pulled off. That was a crazy idea, but they did it and it was successful for the period that it was in. We're in a different era. We have to be adaptable and we have to change. I would say just uh, finishing up um, entertainment is what we need downtown. We have events. We definitely have places to drink and we have places to eat, but we need that entertainment and that entertainment for what we've done and created uh, in the new look of the uh, Trinity Arena. It is um, at the Social Bowl. And who would have thought that throwing axes in downtown Muskegon would become something? But those are the kinds of things that we need to be open to and that we need to have people coming downtown to do things actively and um, um, be involved with those arts and culture and the entertainment aspects. And yeah, I can't determine what that is, um, but as a, our children and grandchildren even, will. Even the changes in the music that that was brought into the Fruin Ball earlier this week when they brought in the Vitamin String Quartet on a free grant that um, was brought in. That was completely not what even my parents were expecting to enjoy. And, and that crowd was on fire. I mean, they loved it. Yes. Of course, Muskegon always likes things that are free, so that that was a, that was a good thing. But Muskegon has great audiences. Yeah, yeah. They have great audiences. Yeah. And you've been a great audience, a great transition. Thank you, everyone, for joining us, and a big thanks to our three panelists. Thank you. Thank you. If you'd like to, uh, the exhibit about the urban renewal process here in the Student Mall is open. We'll keep it open for another 15 minutes or so if you want to check that.